Randomized control trials, or RCTs, are the gold standard to assess the effectiveness of interventions. All RCTs have a methodical commonality, and that is randomization. In this video, you will get to know commonly used randomization methods. The learning goals of this video are to understand the principle of randomization and its advantages, and to become familiar with different randomization strategies. These are simple randomization, block randomization, urn randomization, stratified randomization, covariate adaptive randomization, and minimization. Let's look at an example of why randomization is important. Until the early 2000s, hormone therapy was a commonly recommended preventative intervention to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events in women after menopause. This recommendation was mostly based on findings of the Nurses' Health Study, a large, well-conducted prospective cohort study with more than 59,000 nurses. Authors of the Nurses' Health Study concluded, We observed a marked decrease in the risk of major coronary heart disease among women who took estrogen with progestin. A few years later, the Women's Health Initiative, a large randomized control trial, proved the nurses' health study wrong. The study concluded that estrogen plus progestin does not confer cardiac protection and may increase the risk of coronary heart disease. So what went wrong with the nurses' health study? The most likely explanation is that risk factors for cardiovascular events were not distributed equally between treatment groups. In the nurses' health study, women could choose between taking hormones or not taking hormones because at that time, taking hormones after menopause was considered a healthy choice. Women who took them probably led healthier lives and had fewer cardiovascular risk factors than women who did not choose hormone therapy. A common problem in observational studies which is called selection bias. We can prevent selection bias, however, if everyone in a study has the same probability to be allocated to the treatment or the control group. And the easiest way to achieve this is by flipping a coin, which is the simplest form of randomization. It will lead to an equal distribution of participants' characteristics between two groups. Randomization is the best way to distribute known and unknown prognostic factors equally across treatment groups. Let's look at a few different randomization methods. For the purpose of the slide cast, we assume that randomization is always computer generated. Simple or unrestricted randomization is the easiest and purest form of random assignment. Simple randomization follows the principle of tossing a coin. Each participant has a 50% chance to be allocated to a treatment or a control group. A common problem of simple randomization is that it can lead to unbalanced group sizes and imbalances in prognostic factors when the sample is smaller than 300 participants. Let's assume we randomize 40 participants using simple randomization. We would like to have similar sample sizes in the two treatment groups, but with simple randomization, and a small sample of 40 participants, this is difficult to achieve. When we randomize 40 participants, the probability that sample sizes are similar is only 37%. In other words, chances that we end up with two groups that are imbalanced are pretty high. However, if we increase the sample size to 300 and still use simple randomization, the probability of achieving similar group sizes increases to 91%. Since we cannot always increase the sample size, we need other solutions for small studies. A solution to achieve balanced treatment groups in small studies is a family of randomization methods called restricted randomizations. Restricted randomization refers to any procedure used within random assignment to achieve balance between study groups in size or prognostic factors. To balance group sizes, we can use block randomization or urine randomization, 
To balance prognostic factors between treatment groups, we can use stratified randomization or adaptive randomization. Let's start with a closer look at block randomization. The basic principle of block randomization is that participants are randomized within groups which are called blocks. The block sizes can vary. For example, we could use blocks of four, six, or eight participants. Within a block, Group assignments are always balanced. However, to achieve this balance, some participants are not assigned randomly, but rather assigned following an algorithm. Let's look at one example. Let's assume we use a block of four. The first participant is assigned with a simple randomization to group A. The second participant also gets randomly assigned and ends up in group B. Likewise, the third participant is randomly assigned to group B. To achieve balance within the block, the fourth participant is now assigned to group A without randomization. This last assignment is not random anymore, but per algorithm to achieve balance within the block. Although this method works well to achieve balanced groups, there is one big problem. The last assignment is predictable when the previous assignments within the block are known. Predictable assignments are always problematic for randomized control trials. But there is a solution. It is called permuted block randomization. Permuted block randomization not only randomizes participants, it also randomizes block sizes. For example, we can have blocks of four, blocks of six, and blocks of eight. Each new block gets randomly chosen. So we never know what the current block size actually is, and it becomes difficult to predict whether the next assignment within a block is random or following the algorithm. A different method to ensure that sample sizes are similar across treatment groups is called urn randomization. Urn randomization attempts to correct imbalances in group sizes after each time a participant was randomly allocated. The probability of being assigned to a study group varies according to the imbalance in group sizes. The smaller group always has a higher probability of getting an assignment than the larger group. After each assignment, the probability for the next assignment changes. Let's look at an example. The principle of urn randomization is to draw a marble from an urn that includes an equal amount of green and red marbles. A green marble means an assignment to treatment group A. A red marble to treatment group B. Now, we draw our first marble, which is green, and assigns a participant to treatment A. We put the marble back into the urn, but to increase the probability that the next assignment will be to group B, we also add a red marble to the urn. Or maybe even two red marbles. Now, the probabilities for the next draw are not 50-50 anymore. We now have a 47.6% probability that the next participant will be assigned to group A again, but a 52.3% probability of assignment to group B. Now, let's assume that the next draw will be a green marble again. So now we have two participants in group A and zero in group B. Again, we return the green marble and add another red marble to the urn. The probabilities for the next draw change again. We now have a 45.5% probability that the next assignment will be to group A, but a 54.5% probability that it will be to group B. Over the course of many drawings from the urn, the adaptations of the probabilities will lead to similar group sizes. Sometimes, we are not only concerned about similar sample sizes, but also want to make sure that important prognostic factors are distributed equally. That's when stratified randomization comes into play. Stratified randomization helps to distribute important baseline covariates or prognostic factors between treatment groups. It is usually limited to one or two stratification factors. Stratified randomization is often used in multi-center trials to make sure that each center contributes data to all treatment groups. 
Let's assume we have a population that varies a lot by age, and we want to make sure that older and younger participants are distributed equally between groups. The first step of stratified randomization is stratification. We stratify the population in a group of younger and older participants. In a second step, we randomize within each stratum to group A and group B. There are also other forms of randomization that attempt to balance prognostic factors. They can be summarized under the family of adaptive randomization. Adaptive randomization has the same goal as stratified randomization, but it takes a different approach. It takes prognostic factors of participants into consideration, for example, disease severity or age, before it allocates them to a treatment group. And the allocation of a participant is influenced by existing imbalances of prognostic factors between treatment groups. Adaptive randomization is often used in small or medium trials. Two examples of adaptive randomization are covariate adaptive randomization and minimization. Let's look at covariate adaptive randomization first. Covariate adaptive randomization attempts to balance treatment groups according to a set of known prognostic factors, which are also called covariates. But compared with stratified randomization, it can handle more prognostic factors. Let's have a look at the idea behind covariate adaptive randomization. Let's assume we have two treatment groups, but in group one, participants with the important blue predictive factor are overrepresented. The next participant also has the blue prognostic factor. Covariate adaptive randomization will assign a higher probability during randomization that this participant will be assigned to the group where the blue prognostic factor is underrepresented. It is still possible that the participant will be assigned to the other group, but the probability is lower. The goal is to achieve treatment groups that are balanced regarding prognostic factors. Minimization pursues the same goal as covariate adaptive randomization. It just takes a slightly different approach. In minimization, only the first person from a study is truly randomized. The other participants are assigned on the basis of important prognostic factors to minimize differences. Only if groups are balanced will a study participant be randomly assigned again. Let's return to our previous example. The blue prognostic factors are not balanced between treatment groups. The next participant also has a blue prognostic factor. In minimization, this participant will be matched and assigned to the group where blue prognostic factors are underrepresented. But for covariate adaptive randomization, there would still be a low probability that this participant is assigned to the other group. However, this is not the case for minimization, as this participant will never be assigned to the other group. Again, the goal is to achieve treatment groups that are balanced regarding prognostic factors which, in summary, is the goal of any randomization. Sometimes, it just takes different randomization methods to achieve this goal. If you want to learn more about different designs of randomized control trials, watch our slide.